Welcome to the first segment of the DFD creation tutorial. In this segment, we will read through a process narrative as seen on the left here, identify the entities, which will be people, places, or things, and the activities these entities perform. We'll then record the entities and their corresponding activities in an entity activity table as seen in the document on here on the right. Now, you may be tempted to skip this step as it is tedious and you might find it cumbersome, but I promise you that at least initially, it'll greatly simplify the remainder of the process in creating the context diagram, the physical DFD, and the logical DFD. Students, students often complain that creating DFDs is abstract and soft and squishy. Well, this is the best method I've discovered to make the process concrete and structured. As we read through the narrative, I will bold the entities and underline the activities. This will help illustrate the process of breaking out the entities and activities into a table. You should also note that the sequence of the activities is important. This, will, this is why we number them. In this specific example, the narrative is already in sequential order. Thus, we will not have to reorder the activities after extracting them from our first pass of the narrative. You should always revisit the narrative, though, and ensure that the activities are listed in the order of the time of their occurrence. So let's get started reading through the narrative sentence by sentence. This first sentence says, the Suprina Athletic Company specializes in selling sporting goods, gymnasium equipment, and other athletic supplies to high schools, colleges, and universities. There's not much in that first sentence. You may be tempted to include the Suprina Athletic Company as an entity, but this is the cardinal sin of diagramming. We are diagramming a process within that company. You can kind of think of it as having zoomed in to get a better look at the company's internals. So we're, we no longer have the company in our field of vision. In all of the diagrams that we'll learn to create in this course, this will be the case. We will never include the high level organization on the diagram. We may include departments or sub organizations as entities, but we'll never include the high level organization on our diagram. So let's continue. Customers give their orders to the company's sales representatives at customer locations using the following procedures. Do you see any entities here? Uh, that's right, the customer. They give their order to the sales rep, which is another entity. Note here that for the purposes of creating the entity activity, activity table, we are interested in the entity performing the action. So let's identify those by bolding them. Customers, what do they do? They give their orders to the company sales representatives. And so now let's record this in our table. Customers, the customer gives, we'll do this singular, customer gives order to the sales rep. Then back to our narrative, it says, at the customer locations, Suprina's sales representatives enter customer orders on their laptop computers where they're added to the daily orders file. So you should have recognized that here we've got the customer sales rep performing the action of entering the customer orders on their laptop. So we'll enter that. We'll go to another section here and create a new section for the sales rep. And the sales rep enters customer order into the laptop. But notice that we aren't done with this sentence because it says where they are added to the daily orders files. So who or what adds it to the daily orders file, the sales rep or the laptop? This may seem a bit ambiguous or even unimportant. 
but you will be well served to pay attention to details when diagramming. Here it is the laptop performing the activity. Think about it. The sales rep doesn't have the ability to physically place the data on the disk. The laptop does that. So let's record that. We'll put here, we'll underline it. If you'd like, we could bold the laptop. Oops. And then over here, we'll record it. Laptop. adds the order to the daily orders file. So now let's look back at our narrative and go to the next sentence. Once entered, two copies of the order are printed and the sales rep gives copy one to the customer and retains copy two for his files. So we are still dealing with the sales rep um, and the laptop. So after the laptop adds it, it prints two copies of the order. And then the sales rep does two things, gives the sales order copy one to the customer and files the sales order copy two in his file. So going back here we can identify that two are printed and the sales rep gives copy one to the customer and retains copy two for his files. Notice that sometimes when we're pulling things out of the narrative, it's not always, doesn't always lend itself to bold the entity everywhere. We have to make some inferences about who's performing that. Now, we could have chosen to combine these last two activities. But in this case, the destination for the two copies of the sales order is different, so we keep them separate. We can always combine actions later if we need to, so it always helps to be more detailed when we're doing this. Now back to the next paragraph of the narrative. At the end of the day, the laptop retrieves the day's orders and sends them to the computer at Suprina's headquarters. So let's add the laptop. And we're going to keep the wording at the end of the day because that has special implications for us later on. So when it says things like end of the day or every morning, this is a pretty good hint that we are dealing with a batch process. And we'll discuss this more later, but it provides us a hint that we'll need a data store. Okay, so moving back to the narrative, the computer, this is the headquarters computer, calculates various totals, such as the number of orders and number of line items on the order and records those totals with the orders in the customer file. So we'll split this up into two uh, activities. So we're gonna record this in our table, let's say the headquarter computer calculates various totals for example, we'll keep these details because it helps us later, the number of orders and the number of line items. And then it records the totals 
and the orders in the customer order file. Now let's look at the next paragraph. What entities and actions do you see? Let's highlight them as we go along. Each morning, the computer at Saprina headquarters displays the customer order file with totals to the order entry clerk. Let's add that. Again, we're going to keep the time wording each morning. It displays the customer order file with totals to the order entry clerk. So back to our narrative, the clerk reviews the orders and compares the totals for each sales rep's orders with the totals that the computer has provided. So we're going to enter the order entry clerk, and she reviews the orders and compares each sales rep's totals with the totals provided by the computer. After being notified by the clerk, the computer begins processing the customer orders by performing a series of programmed edits. Now there's a couple of activities here. One's implied right here. It's implied that the order entry clerk notifies the headquarter computer to proceed. So this may be a push of a button or a click of a mouse, but we should capture that. And then the headquarter computer, whoops, I've been putting hardware computer. Let's make that headquarter. Performs a series of programmed edits. Now back here it gives us more details about those edits. Data from the customer master file is access to validate customer name and address. So the headquarter computer validates customer name and address with the customer master file. And by adding these files in our descriptions, it'll help us know what data stores we'll be using later. And then the inventory master file is accessed to check for inventory availability and pricing. So the computer checks inventory availability and pricing in the inventory master file. Next, the customer's credit limit from the customer master file is then compared to the amount of the order, outstanding sales order from the sales order master file, and accounts receivable balances. So we'll add checks, customer's credit limit, in the customer master file against the order amount and we add all these things in because it will help us later on when we're especially when we're creating our document flowchart we get the outstanding sales orders from the sales order master file and we compare it against the accounts receivable.
Now notice the last sentence here says, if any order fails these edits, the clerk is notified. So this is what we call an error routine. Um, so we're just going to record that here. If any check fails, the computer notifies the order entry clerk. Now we'll handle these a little different in our diagrams, but we'll put it here and show you how to do that later. Okay, so the last paragraph says customer orders that pass these tests are then recorded on the sales order master file and the inventory balances are reduced. So who or what does this? The headquarter computer does. So we're going to say records the customer order in the sales order master file. And also note that it also at the same time reduces the inventory balances. Now these are two pretty independent activities, so we should list them as such. And then lastly, two copies of the sales order are printed and sent to the customer, copy one, which we'll call an order acknowledgement, and to the warehouse, copy two, which we'll call a picking ticket. So we'll say prints two copies of the sales order, then it sends the order acknowledgement, which is copy one to the customer, and sends the picking ticket, which is copy two, to the warehouse. And now that we've completed the narrative, let's take a look at our activity entity activity table. As mentioned before, this narrative already has the activities in sequential order. Otherwise, we'd have to make another pass and ensure that the activities are in sequential order. We do this because it simplifies the creation of DFDs in the future. But at this point, we're pretty much done ordering the activities in the entity activity table. One thing that's always good to do is take, to take time and go back through the narrative and make sure we didn't miss any details. For example, now that I'm done, having done this several times before, I notice that we miss an important detail up here dealing with the laptop. So if we look here, it says at the end of the day, it retrieves the day's orders. If we go back over here and find the corresponding sentence, the laptop retrieves the day's orders and sends them to the computer at Saprina headquarters. This is an important activity to send to break out. So we want to add sends the day's orders to the headquarter computer. And it'll be more clear why I wanted to add this back in when we do segment two of this tutorial. But to review what we did today in this segment, we simply read through the narrative and broke out the entities and activities into this table template as we went along. Our next step is to identify the information and non-information processing activities and we'll do this in the next segment of the tutorial.